Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Bipan Chand, who's going to speak about the endoscopic management of strictures. Good morning. I'd like to thank uh, Sages as well as the uh, chairs for allowing me to speak this morning about uh, the management of uh, strictures. This is my disclosure slide. Nothing's going to be uh, relevant uh, to my uh, talk this morning. My objective really is going to, to review the uh, different types or causes of strictures and describe the different uh, techniques of uh, managing these uh, strictures, review the uh, literature that looks at the success rates of uh, 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 resolution of strictures, and then review some of the complications and best ways to uh, manage uh, these uh, complications. Clearly, there's a lot of strictures that uh, GI tract surgeons uh, deal with, um, and it's important when you first start uh, to manage these uh, strictures is really identify the etiology of these uh, strictures. Some of the common causes of least of proximal strictures in the esophagus and the stomach um, can include uh, peptic ulcer disease uh, strictures. You can have rings uh, that uh, are stigmata of uh, reflux disease, such as Sotsky's rings. You can undergo management for cancer, such as esophageal or gastric cancers, as well as some uh, therapies uh, from radiation to what I see most common and probably what most in the audience uh, see, which are uh, post-surgery from esophageal to uh, gastric surgery to bariatric surgery, as well as some of the other benign conditions that are out there. I think it's important when you first start to deal with these strictures, it's important not also to recognize the etiology of these strictures, but also it's important to recognize the location of these strictures. That's going to help uh, determine what your best management strategies are going to be. For anastomotic strictures, some of the most important things is understanding the type of anastomosis that's uh, created. If it's an operation like a bariatric procedure, Obviously, a lot of these anastomoses are purposely created small. It's important to realize the size of the technique from a circular to a linear to a hand-sewn technique. It's also important to realize the time from the uh, initial operation uh, to the, uh, the timing of the stricture, and that's going to dictate how aggressive you're going to be in the management of these uh, strictures. But I think for all of us that do a lot of endoscopy, it's going to be very important to uh, understand all the different tools that are available to you to manage these strictures from balloons to bougies to using not only endoscopy but also using fluoroscopy and then some of the other things that you can use in adjunct to, to your management from steroids uh, to using some of the different cautery techniques. If you look at the underlying etiologies and diseases, uh, there is a good classification system. If you look at the literature, a lot of the studies uh, that are published are going to be referencing the Atkinson the classification uh, dysphagia scoring system. So it's important to get familiar with the various degrees of dysphagia. And then this classification from 0 to 4 really are looking at uh, both uh, solid to liquid uh, tolerability. I think it's important to understand what those are. And then when you look at the literature, you can understand the uh, uh, comparisons. Uh, but again, the underlying disease from malignancies to, again, the most common, what I see in my practice, which is the post-surgical, I think it's important to understand also the etiology from the post-surgical, from the ischemic early strictures that you can see to some of the subcatrial strictures that we see, which are really lack of use. Those are the mucosal strictures to the fibrotic or severely inflammatory strictures. And then you can dictate uh, your management algorithm for those various uh, post-anastomotic uh, strictures. If you look at the techniques for dilation, uh, from a bougie to a balloon dilation, and the bougie dilation, there's always the rule of three, uh, which is easy to remember. Uh, you start out with the initial choice of your dilator based on the stricture diameter, and then you do three consecutive dilations with the incremental increases of one millimeter. Uh, that's uh, pretty standard for, uh, for uh, use of uh, bougies. And the balloon dilations, usually incremental dilations, and most balloons are going to they themselves have the size uh, in in the uh, the CRA balloon from the small balloons to the larger balloons, and I'll go over uh, some of those uh, incremental increases as well. But if you look at the literature of the overall uh, techniques, both the bougie and the balloon, you'll find most of the papers are really going to show no difference in the efficacy, uh, but there may be some uh, more cost effectiveness to using the bougie. 
uh, compared to the balloon uh, techniques. This is just some examples of the bougies uh, that you may be familiar with. Uh, the most uh, uh, common ones that are out there are the Maloney and the Savory. The difference in these balloons are going to be the wire-guided or non-wire-guided uh, 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 balloons. And in our hospital, it's very common for our thoracic surgeons to be very comfortable with using the bougies and a lot of the bariatric surgeons and gastrologists using the uh, balloon technique. So I think a lot of it depends on your comfort level of which uh, type of uh, dilation uh, device that you're going to be using. Uh, and most often, if you are going to be using bougie, I think it's imperative that you do have fluoroscopy readily available uh, and to help guide at least uh, the strictures that are severe and the ones that require wire uh, guidance as well. Uh, some of the trials that are out there that looked at the use of uh, uh, bougies as well as here's one looking at uh, using electrocautery. In this trial, they looked at 62 patients that had uh, post-esophageal uh, uh, surgery strictures, and they looked at the number of sessions that were required after using the uh, two different techniques. Uh, in this slide, you can see in the description of using the, uh, the actual cautery. And the pictures really de depict how they used a simple needle knife to basically incise the anastomosis uh, circumferentially using small four millimeter cuts. And again, as what most of the literature shows, the overall difference or success rate in using either a bougie or using this electrocautery uh, technique really did not show any statistical uh, difference. And really the overall uh, resolution was uh, about the uh, same in both of, the, both of those. Uh, trials looking at bougies versus using CRE or through the scope of balloons in this study looking at 17 patients in both arms found the same thing, no difference uh, seen in the resolution of strictures, and these are peptic strictures in both of the uh, uh, techniques mentioned. Use of some of the adjuncts using steroid therapy, does uh, that help in the benign esophageal strictures? There is good literature to show that patients that have benign diseases, uh, adding the addition of steroid injection at the site of the stricture circumferentially will help decrease the overall need for additional uh, dilations here. Uh, this uh, study looked at the grade of dysphagia using the Atkinson the grading scale and looking at before and after injection of steroid therapy. After injection, they were able to reduce the number of episodes of subsequent uh, dilation. And this has also been demonstrated in other uh, subsequent studies as well. If you look at the different balloons that are available, the most common used uh, balloons or the TTS through the scope balloons, essentially they are CRA balloons that really have themselves a stepwise uh, change in the diameter. And the smallest balloons go from five to seven millimeters, so that sequential dilation to the larger balloons uh, from 18 to 20 millimeter. And these are not balloons that typically are used for achalasia. These are the balloons that you typically use for the pylorus or esophageal area. And realize that you're going to have a significant change in your PSI or your atmospheric pressure when you have this incremental increase. And again, these can be wire-guided or non-wire-guided gu balloons as well. And this uh, series of pictures basically just depicts how you're going to use that balloon with your endoscopic visualiz visualization. I think that's one of the big advantages that the uh, balloon has over the bougie. You can safely visualize your actual device as demonstrated here with the balloon going across the area of the stricture with the catheter going across first, making sure the balloon is complete out of the working channel, and then you can visualize the balloon infl uh, uh, being inflated. And a lot of times I'll use the balloon and I'll pull that balloon up against the actual end of my endoscope and I can visualize through the balloon and see the actual stricture itself, look for a concomitant ulcer or any other disease process uh, that's around as well. And this is the, the sequence that you would do for a CRE balloon uh, dilation. It's also important to look at the differences in what the balloons and bougiers are doing. And I think uh, the bougies themselves have additional uh, both longitudinal uh, force dilation as well as that radial force that is an advantage over the CRE uh, balloons that typically have just a radial of force uh, dilation. Uh, and that is some of the differences uh, in the devices themselves. This is a study that we have in publication that looked at management of strictures after at least bariatric surgery and is it important to use uh, timing from the actual operation to at least give you an idea if you're going to have a success uh, in resolving that uh, endoscopically. Uh, here we had a total of 72 patients with various uh, strictures and looked at them <clears throat> after their bariatric operation and broke them arbitrarily into three different uh, classifications. And clearly the ones that uh, came to us early 
had a higher success of resolution within the luminal uh, balloon dilation to the ones that were more than a year out or even more than three months out. Uh, but it should, goes to show you even these strictures that are later on, the more fibrotic and inflammatory type strictures can still be managed uh, endoscopically. So you shouldn't give up uh, just based on the timing from the operation. I think it's also important for all to know the different coding uh, systems that are out there. This is just some of the different uh, codes that are going to be relevant uh, to your uh, endoluminal dilation uh, techniques as well. Some of the complications that you're going to see with uh, balloons, uh, aspiration, obviously it's very important when you're managing these uh, strictures that you have a very good control of the airway, that you manage these patients in a very uh, safe environment. Uh, they obviously are going to require some form of a sedation, uh, so that's going to be imperative that you have that secured. Bleeding usually is self-limited. Remember most of these therapies, uh, bougie or balloon techniques, are going to be tearing the mucosa of itself, but most often that's going to be limited. If you do see that occur, especially if you're doing a CRE balloon, usually the easiest and simplest thing to do is just reinflate the balloon again, uh, not to the same pressure, but most often that's going to tamponade the bleeding itself. <clears throat> and then some of the other techniques, uh, using clips or using cautery is also going to be able to manage the, your uh, complication from a bleeding. Perforations, you heard from Jeff Hazy's talk earlier today. Most often, the perforations that you see is really going to be more indicative, not of the technique, but really the underlying uh, disease itself with the malignancies having the higher rate of uh, perforations to the radiation injuries. Most of the literature in post-surgical um, perforations are typically going to be less than uh, 5%. And again, it's imperative that clinically you be have a really high suspicion for the potential of perforation. We're really going to follow that up with some type of a contrast uh, imaging, most often uh, either a gastrograph and swallow, where if you're doing something in the lower GI tract, then using a barium uh, or a gastrograph and enema, and that's going to be very imperative. Some of the other perforations, obviously, understand the underlying disease process, uh, location of the injury is going to be very important. Also, recognition or time of, uh, of uh, knowing when that injury occurs from the perforation, if it's in the endoscopy suite to the recovery room to post uh, on the floor, uh, your management's going to vary. If I see a perforation in the endoscopy suite, most often I'm going to try to manage that endoscopically. Uh, and see if I can either clip it or cover it. And more and more times we're starting to use uh, stents as you heard earlier for the management of some of our complications as well. If you look at the last category, the stents for refractory strictures, how good are stents? Uh, right now, the answer is we don't know. A lot of studies are very small as uh, what's demonstrated here in this uh, chart. Most uh, authors are using these stents, and you have to remember all these stents that were discussed earlier typically are used off-label. These uh, metallic stents are not uh, typically used for benign uh, strictures. They're typically being used for malignancies, except for the polyflex uh, stent that's available. Uh, the stents, at least uh, in this chart here, you can look at the small number of patients, up to uh, five patients using these self-expanding metallic stents. Again, the complications are going to be high with the potential for migration as well as for the potential of tissue ingrowth. And so right now the answer is not uh, clear. And it's going to be really important that when you do look at, uh, at least for benign refractory strictures, you have a very good indication for it. You tried all the other uh, uh, trials before going to a stent management. If you're going to choose a metal stent, you have to be very cautious of the non-covered uh, stents. You can have a significant amount of tissue ingrowth. And there are new stents that are going to hopefully become av available that are going to be absorbable stents. They're not currently on the market, uh, but they're all under investigation. I would tell you that the surveillance for these stents and the duration is going to probably be the two most important things long term. You've already heard a little bit about the different te uh, technologies that are out there. But I remember again, the nitinol based stents are typically used for malignancies, not for benign uh, diseases. The silicone and polyester stents, uh, the only one that's available in the market for benign diseases, have a very high migration rate. So that's a very uh, difficult thing that we have to deal with. You heard this already from the uh, Missouri group. I'm not going to go a lot uh, into this. Uh, I just want to highlight the two important things that are on there. Uh, at least uh, if you're going to have metallic uh, stents placed, it's going to be very important that you have some type of uh, surveillance. 
I typically recommend doing weekly uh, plain films on these uh, patients. And again, if you look at uh, what your indication, at least for strictures, and that's what we're really focusing, I'm focusing on, most of these patients don't tolerate stents for a very long time because you can imagine that mechanical dilation 24 hours, seven days a week, the tolerability of that for most patients is gonna be very, very low. And that's been uh, panned out in the literature as well. Uh, we've published uh, similar results looking at management of uh, nastomotic strictures as well as uh, leaks using all various different types of uh, devices from covered metal stents to the polyester to the salivary or plastic stents. Uh, again, most of our strictures, we've had a small number of patients that have uh, strictures. Overall success rate is going to be low in the majority of these uh, patients. In my last slide, this is just a summary of uh, management of uh, strictures. I think this is a very stepwise algorithmic approach uh, to all of the different uh, disease uh, etiologies from the benign diseases. The first step is going to be using some form of dilation. It's probably going to be a bougie or a balloon. Your second step is going to be to add some type of incremental uh, usage of either steroids or using electro incision uh, therapy. Your third step is probably going to be using some form of a stent. Uh, and your fourth, and this is something that I do very infrequently in my practice, is having patients uh, self-dilate uh, themselves. But that's also a uh, potential algorithm in patients with these uh, types of uh, strictures. Thank you very much.